God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Samuel and Joshua. We appreciate you singing for us tonight. It's wonderful to hear the voices of children. What wonderful blessings to have children. Now, Stephen is going to come up here. That's their dad, the one that's going to come here in a second. And he's going to read the scriptures for us. And uh, he's also been serving the Lord on the mission field. And in fact, that's where he got his wife. Am I not mistaken? Amen, yes. <laughs> Stephen? Thank you. I'd like to invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of John, chapter 4. John chapter 4, we'll read from verses 30 to 42. I'd like to ask you to stand as we read the Holy Word of God. John chapter 4, verses 30 to 42. The Word of God says, Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed to him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My need is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye that there is yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look unto the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Another men laboreth, and ye are entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testifieth. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word, and saith unto the woman, Now we believe. Not because of the saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word. Before Brother Ricker comes, I hope you've noticed we have three generations of Rickers here with us tonight. The grandfather, the son, and the grandsons. What a blessing have them all here with us in this place. And Brother Ricker has been a missionary from this church for many, many, many years in South America, in Central America. He's a man of God who has faithfully carried on the Word of God and proclaimed it with diligence and with boldness, with articulateness. And tonight he comes to share the Word of God with us. And we hope you can come back on Wednesday to see his audiovisual presentation. So tonight, the Word of God. Brother Ricker. <clears throat> The Lord is good, and we're looking forward to blessings tonight through the Word of God <coughs> by the Holy Spirit. And we might say that tomorrow, uh, Wednesday night, uh, Stephen will show a PowerPoint. And also, Evelyn will be able to give a few words. The ladies like to hear Evelyn, so Wednesday night, come out to hear Evelyn give a few words. Now, tonight, we want to look at the scriptures that we have read. And the title of our message will be, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white unto harvest. John 4, 31 to 42. Lift up your eyes and see the opportunities, the opportunities to serve God and cooperate in national and foreign missions. We're going to use this text as well as other texts to bring out the fact that we have, have a missionary vision around the world. And what is the purpose of this mission, this message tonight? 
It is that God will give you a vision, a vision to labor and to testify here in Collingswood or other parts of the United States or other parts of the world, other nations around the world. The whole gospel to the whole world, the whole Bible to the whole world. Now Jesus must needs go uh, to Samaria to see the Samaritan woman. And uh, Samaria was the part of the country north of Jerusalem, above Jerusalem, were the Samaritans. Samaritans were half Jewish and half Gentile. And while waiting for his disciples to go to town to buy food and meat, uh, Jesus uh, rested on Jacob's well. Jacob's well, very famous. And a lady passed by with a water pot with a water vessel to draw water. So Jesus asked her, uh, give me a drink. And she said, the, Samarit the Jews don't speak to the Samaritans. Give me a drink. And the woman uh, asked, uh, responded that if, uh, actually if uh, the Messiah would come, he would tell us all things. She was a believer in the scriptures. And she didn't know Jesus, but she believed in the scriptures. She knew that the Old Testament talked about a Messiah, talked about an anointed one. But Jesus said to her, if you knew who spoke to you, he would have given you living water, living water, a figure of speech. What does living water mean as a figure of speech? It means that Jesus would give her salvation salvation for her sins. Now we know that this lady had five husbands and the one man that she was living with was not her husband. Jesus spoke to this woman about her sin and many times before people get saved they have to be convicted of sin. Five husbands, that's quite a few, that's as many as they have in Hollywood. <laughs> uh, but she said, uh, you must be a prophet a prophet to know my sins and but when the Messiah comes he will tell you all things so Jesus answered and said I that speak unto thee is the Messiah <gasps> wow what a statement and she left her water pot and ran off to her Samaritan village to tell the men there I have seen the Messiah come and hear him He's the Messiah. He has told me all things. He's a prophet of the prophets, the one that Moses spoke about. Come and see a man that told me all things about myself. Is not he the Messiah? And they came to see and hear for themselves. They came and believed themselves. The wonderful story here in, in the scriptures explains John 4.42. And he said unto the woman, well, they, they said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. The disciples turned to Jesus before this happened and said, Master, eat. And in verse 4, 4, uh, 31, in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. I have meat to eat that you know not of. In 442, but he said unto them, the disciples, I have meat to eat that you know not of. My meat is to do the will of God that sent me. I'm in Samaria to save souls. I'm here to do a work. And that's the first, first point of the message. Jesus explains the figure of speech. What was the figure of speech? I have meat to eat that ye know not. This figurative speech is very important. The Bible is a literal book, but there are figures of speech, figurative language, and we have to interpret them uh, correctly. It must be done carefully. In other words, Jesus was saying, my meat is to do the will of the Lord. My work is to do the will of God. My labor is to do the will of God. My ministry 
is to do the will of God that sent me. Now, what is the will of God for Jesus to do? Well, we, he came to Samaria. He was to save this Samaritan woman. She knew about Jesus. She knew the scriptures, and she quoted them to them. When the Messiah comes, he will tell all things. And Jesus said, I am he that speaks to you. It was to save the men that would come and hear Jesus for themselves. And when they heard his testimony, they believed. It was to finish his ministry on earth. The will of God was to finish his ministry directed from heaven uh, on earth to do missions and evangelism through the church until Jesus come back to rapture the church. We believe in the rapture of the church. Do you believe also? Amen. Amen. The Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Fathers, Father so, Father so, <laughs> pits figurative speech uh, of the Holy, uh, uh, Holy Supper, the Lord's Supper. Eat, this is my body. Drink, this is my blood. And they make it literal speech. Instead of interpreting as spiritual speech, as they should have, they come up with the abominable mass. And they think they are eating Jesus' body. They think they are drinking, that is, the priests think they are drinking the blood of Christ. And yet their eyes say no. Their tongue says no. But they still believe this because they've been brainwashed as children to hear this over and over again, that the priest has the power to change uh, the elements into the body, the real, the body, physical, uh, literal body of, of Christ. They are drinking his blood physically and materially, literally, so they think. These simple words of Jesus, this is my body, this is my blood, they are simple words and they don't have to be twisted, and yet they make them so literal that they think that they are actually eating the body of Christ and drinking his blood. They're using language in a physical way instead of spiritually with faith. It's figurative language, not physical, not material, not, not literal. Now the Amils that interpret scripture, they do, they do just the opposite. <laughs> they take literal language, and some of our Amil friends take literal language and they make it spiritual. Is Jesus coming back on earth to go into Jerusalem? Will he plant his feet after the seven year tribulation? Will he come back and actually go into Jerusalem and reign on the throne of David? That is what? Spiritual language? No, it's literal language. <laughs> and Jesus Christ is coming back and he will come back on earth going to Jerusalem on the throne of David and reign for a thousand years. Now the Amils take physical language and make it spiritual in the prophecies, just the reverse that what the Catholics do. Very well, our second point in the message is the will of God was his earthly ministry when here on earth. His earthly ministry. Now he went to have, uh, well, he went to have and performed his work through the church. God is working through the church in these days. He's working through your church here in Collingswood. He's doing a work of missions and evangelism on earth through the church. The Holy Spirit will direct the national and foreign missions with evangelism. The earthly ministry of Jesus was three and a half years. Three and a half years after he was baptized and when he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The first year was a year of what? Popularity. He was so popular, everybody came to him. He did miracles. He preached such wonderful messages like the Sermon on the Mount. And everybody came to him. He preached great mission uh, messages with parables and many miracles. Now the second year of his ministry was a year of opportunity opportunity and he preached and taught great heart searching messages and more miracles but with some opposition we come to his third year of of ministry 
and the third year of his ministry, he preached and taught the Jews, but more with his disciples. He was preparing them when he would leave, but with strong, very strong opposition from the religious leaders, who is making fuss in the religious world today. False religious leaders. We think of the World Council of Churches with the ecumenicals. We think of the Catholic Church with all its power from Rome. And we think of the World Evangelical Alliance getting back to be with Rome and with the uh, modernness of the World Council of Churches. Well, the Pharisees in the Bible, the Sadducees that didn't believe in the resurrection, and the scribes, and the priests, and the high priests, and the Herodians, they persuaded Pontius Pilate to kill the God-man, the man-God, Jesus Christ, sending him to the old wooden cross to actually die and give his blood as a sacrifice once and for all, a blood sacrifice for my sin and for your sin if you believe. Now the elect will believe. Are you part of the elect? How do you know the elect? If you believe, <laughs> then you know you are the elect. God calls the elect uh, and justifies them. He calls the elect and he sanctifies them. He calls the elect uh, to glorify him. And yet, we actually, we believe that our position in Christ Jesus includes glorification. And they, that is our position. Now, our third point tonight will be that Jesus said we should avoid excuses and putting off to evangelize and do missionary work and missions. Does Jesus say in these passages not to have excuses? Yes, he does. That is what he is saying in John 4.35a. Say ye not, there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. That is the title of our message, lift up your eyes. Look unto the harvest in Collingswood, surrounding area. Lift up your eyes and look uh, in Guatemala. There are fields of white there and around the world. World missions, the Bible for the whole world. <laughs> Jesus Christ and his gospel for the whole world. You shall look for opportunities of today in missions and evangelization. Don't keep saying tomorrow we will do missions and evangelism in Collingswood. Don't say tomorrow we'll pray for missions in Guatemala, missions in other places around the world. Today is the time to start and to finish. Don't put off pulpit evangelism. Don't put off church evangelism. Don't put off personal evangelism one on one. Time is at essence. The Independent Board for Presbyterian Home Missions have bought 5,000 Gospels of John. You probably got some of them here. And I can think of churches, Bible Presbyterian churches around the nation they got these Gospels of John, and the idea was to evangelize. I thought many times, if every Bible Presbyterian church got these Gospels and began to witness to their neighbors, to their friends, to their relatives, that we would have a revival. What do you think? If every Bible Presbyterian took the Gospel of John to his neighbor, his friends, down the street in the markets, we were preaching down in North Carolina, a church had many elderly people. They had arthritis. <laughs> they had rheumatism. And they couldn't walk. They couldn't knock on doors. You know what we told them? They had to get groceries. <laughs> Even if you can't walk too well, you get to the grocery store. <laughs> and at the grocery store, whether it's Walmart or a ShopRite and all the rest, you know in the back people are waiting. They're waiting, and you get back there, and you stand, and when you see a person waiting, you pray, maybe that's the person you want me to give the Gospel of John. Or outside, people are waiting. So you don't have to walk. <laughs> you can be at the market, and just wait your turn when somebody is 
waiting for a taxi or waiting for somebody to pick them up, that's the one you can get it to. So we're glad that the whole missions have bought these Gospel of John's. And uh, we looked at the people who do evangelism, and uh, we know that many uh, people will say, uh, let's wait. I'm as in some churches, some Bible Presbyterian churches, say, we got the Gospels, but let's wait. Let's wait. Others say, let's wait to organize. And others will say, let's get at it. <laughs> let's give out the Gospel of John. Let's preach the Gospel. Let's teach the Gospel. Well, down in Guatemala, we had received 7,000 Gospel of John and then 3,000. Do you think our two churches, Bible Presbyterian churches in in Guatemala could give, that, give out that many Gospel of John? Of course not. So we have the preachers of our CF, the Confederation of Evangelical Fundamental Churches, and we give it to the pastor and the people of those churches. Is that going to take up 10,000 Gospel of John? No. Well, people would come into our Trinitarian Bible Society, and they want to evangelize the people in the hospitals, in the prisons, and in the schools, and the universities. So they come in and get these Gospels of John to give out and to witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. We say that some wait, waited a long time, others are still waiting, but we thank God for those who took the Gospel of John and started giving them out. And why should we give them out? Look unto the fields, they're white unto harvest. In Guatemala, do we have fields white unto the harvest? Yes, we see them. In Collingswood, do you have fields white unto the harvest? Waiting for you to evangelize. Well, they, the people that say, put it off. Four months, and we'll evangelize. Four months, we'll give out the Gospel of John. Well, what they need is verse 35a. <laughs> Say ye not, say ye not, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they white unto harvest. We can see in Guatemala, the fields are still white unto harvest. Uh, the people in Collingswood, are, any, are there any unsaved people in, in Collingswood? Are there any elect people that have not been saved yet in Collingswood? Amen. All right. There you have it. There's some elect out there. We don't know where they are, but we preach to everybody who'll listen. Amen? <laughs> everybody who'll listen and, get, and listen to our voice, we give out to God. God will do the rest. He, he knows his elect. And elect will be saved. And elect will be justified and sanctified and glorified. So we praise God that uh, 35A is the thing to help us not wait four months. And uh, we have to think of ways we can get out the Gospel of John. Whether you have rheumatism <laughs> or arthritis, uh, there are certain places you go to buy. Walmart, you have a Walmart, you have a ShopRite <laughs> and other stores. Well, they are people. You have to get your groceries, you have to get physical food, so the people waiting there at the end, inside or outside, are good targets. And we would repeat John 35b uh, in that sense. Lift up your eyes and look unto the fields, for they are white already unto harvest. Is that true for Collingswood? Amen. Amen. I want to tell you about some of the things, uh, missions in in Guatemala. In Guatemala. Uh, are there any more elect in Guatemala? Yeah. Yes. Are there any more unsaved in Guatemala? Yes. So we have to look up on the fields. They are white unto harvest. Now after the Gospel of John in, in Guatemala, praise God, we're able to get 35,500 Gospels of Romans. Now, to give out the Gospels of John, what, how can you follow up giving out the Gospel of John with the Book of Romans? <laughs> Do you think we can give out uh, 35,000 Gospels of Romans? No way. We get Our two churches take some, the pastors of the evangelical Bible-believing pastors that want to defend the faith in, in, 
in Guatemala, they'll take some and their people will take some. But we have to get them out. I think about 12,000 have already gone out uh, with the Book of Romans to evangelize the people. And uh, we trust that God will use them. I had a secretary in the Trinitarian Bible Society, an older man. He came, I think, from Nicaragua. He went to Moody Bible Institute. And he knew English very well. He knew the gospel very well. But before that, how did he get to Moody to study? He had the Book of Romans. And as he read the Book of Romans, he was saved. God uses his holy word. He read and he got saved by the Book of Romans. So we praise God for that. Generally in Guatemala, we give out about 2,000 calendars. Now back on the display, you'll see the calendar a colored calendar with one, one verse of scripture every month. Another calendar there has a verse of scripture every day of the year. 365 verses of scripture. So we give them out and uh, we look to the Lord to save the people. We had a man that uh, got a calendar and he saw the address. He came to our church in Los Angeles little town, not Los Angeles, California, Los Angeles, Guatemala. And he came and uh, came with his family. And that's the thing. We like to see that fruit. We give out the calendars and some people come to church. Well, we, we all should say in Guatemala, we were able, with the help of the Lord, to publish 6,000 Bibles. That's a lot. Huh? But before that, from the States, we got 25,000. But really... 24,100. The 900 had defects. And these defects, we wanted to get these Bibles, we would fix them up and give them out to the people. And the printer that helped us get these Bibles here in the States, in Florida, said, no way! We use those 900 to give out to the people in hospitals and prisons here in the States. So we couldn't get another 25,000. Well, a printer in Guatemala was all excited could he be the one to publish a full Spanish Bible in Guatemala? Now, the Gospels were published there many times, and the New Testament, and some Jews, the Old Testament, but no full Bible. Old Testament, New Testament together in Spanish. And he was all thrilled. And we were thrilled that we could publish real Bibles, the whole Bible in Spanish. Generally, we got the Bibles uh, in times past from the United States, from England. We got them from Mexico. We got them from Korea and China. And generally, they were imported. So we were very happy and it gave us thrill to get the Bibles printed in, in Guatemala. Now, our Trinitarian Bible Society, when we first started back in 1970, you know how we started? With 12 Bibles and six New Testaments. What do you think happened to the New Testaments? I looked, there were six. There's only four. There's only three. These New Testaments were <laughs> taken by people who wanted them. <laughs> and then finally we got the privilege to order a hundred Bibles. That was terrific. And then we had the next uh, aspect, we had the thrill of ordering a thousand Bibles. And uh, we should tell you, at the earthquake, we got 5,000 New Testaments. And we were able to give them out to the children in the schools. And later on, a few years later, we got 10,000 New Testaments from the Trinitarian Bible Society in London. Now, our Trinitarian Bible Society in Guatemala is independent. We don't get subsidies from England. <laughs> we don't get subsidies, uh, subsidies from uh, uh, London. Uh, but the Lord helps us, and we're glad to get the Bibles out. So we have a new aspect for you. How many of you folks know about the Gideons? Yes. What do the Gideons do? They place Bibles in the hotels and in the New Testaments in the schools, and they get out the Bibles in New Testament that way. So we said to ourselves, the Gideons doing a good work, and the uh, in times past, we had a hospital, small hospital, and we put Bibles in, in, the, in the rooms. When we went back, they were all gone. <laughs> the people took them home. Well, praise God, they took them home. So we want to go back to the 
hospitals and put Bibles in. But the Gideons get these Bibles out and New Testaments in the schools. And we said, well, we can do that too in Guatemala. Now, 6,000 Bibles, and some of them have already gone out, of course. But uh, we thought we could do it at $3.50 a Bible. That's a little bit less than five. And how, how much does it cost to send out a dozen Bibles? $42. And you want to send out 29 Bibles? That's going to cost you $100. So we're starting a new campaign. People want to get Bibles in the hands of unbelievers, in the hands of the, of the people in Guatemala that need the Bible. Well, that's part of the work in Guatemala. We have a, a display in the foyer of the church and look over the display and there you can see the Bible. We couldn't get Bible paper to publish our Bible. Bible paper is thinner and it takes a good press uh, to publish thin paper. But we got a good white paper with a print that would be a normal print. In Guatemala they have some cheap Bibles and you can hardly read them. They're so small and they're printed on newspaper, newspaper print. So pray for us in Guatemala, for the two churches, the Trinitarian Bible Society, the CF. What is the CF? The Confederation of Evangelical Fundamental Churches. There we have two good words. Fundamental and evangelical. And pray for us. Pray for the men. We meet every month. We did meet every month. And in 2016, we changed. We said we're going to have every other month we'll meet and plan for services. We have a Reformation service uh, in October, the end of October, Reformation Sunday. And the 15th of August, we also have a Bible conference on a very timely subject. So this year we decided to have a business session every other month. And the other uh, month we would have a roundtable discussion. Now, the first church we went to, down the coast. Now, Guatemala, around Guatemala, have an even temperature. But once we leave Guatemala in that section, we get hot and hotter as we go down to the coast. But we go up in the mountains where it gets cold and colder. I was preaching up in the mountains in February. I pretty near froze to death. I had four or five blankets on me. That wasn't enough. So I put a plastic sheet on the top. The next morning... I left, looked under the, the plastic sheet, it was all wet. <laughs> but God helped us, and we're glad to preach the gospel in Guatemala and many places. So pray for the Trinity Bible Society, pray for our CF, Confederation of what, what churches? Evangelical Fundamental Churches. Now it's hard to find fundamental pastors. It's hard to find gospel preaching, Bible-believing pastors who want to defend the faith. You have that difficulty here? Amen. <laughs> it's hard to find them. We just have a few pastors, and some of them are Baptists, some are Presbyterian, and some are independent, and we like to work with people that love the Lord and have no connection with the ecumenical movement or nothing with the Catholic Church as well, and also nothing with the World Evangelical Alliance. What do you folks know about the World Evangelical Alliance? Well, the Evangelical Alliance, of, uh, the World Evangelical Alliance said, in the world there are three Christian groups. This is coming from the lips and the writings of the new evangelicals in the World Evangelical Alliance. The first group of Christians are the Catholics. The second group of Christians are the churches in the World Council of Churches. And the third group of Christians is the World Evangelical Alliance. Do you think that's a good description of Christianity? No. I don't think that's a good uh, description of Christianity. So pray for our CF. And when we were up in Mexico, one time we had a church in Mexico, we had a visit every three months to hold the fort until we could get a pastor. The young pastor finally came down. But that church we had an elder, not like the elders here at your church, we had this cantankerous elder. And I, when I'd be preaching, he would stop me. No, that's not right. Well, I only came up every three months, 
and I bore <laughs> that burden. But when they finally got a pastor after two years, he came down from Mexico City, and he was preaching away, and this elder uh, did the same thing. Well, this young pastor couldn't take it. <laughs> I took it for two years, and I felt so sorry because the young pastor came down uh, from Mexico, and he was only there for six months, and he split the church. He couldn't take this cantankerous uh, elder in the church. I trust there are no cantankerous pastors in this uh, elders in this church. <laughs> They're all good elders. Is that right? <laughs> Amen. All right. So pray for us, the, the three things we have in Guatemala, to get out the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in many ways, always possible, and to confirm the believers. Back in our display, you'll see some of our literature that we have from the Trinity and Bible Society, some to evangelize, some to help the Christians grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then also to defend the faith. So we feel if we can uh, preach the gospel and get the Christians to know the, the Bible and the great doctrines of the Reformation and uh, defend the faith, that will be our ministry in Guatemala. There's a fourth thing that we should emphasize. The two churches we have, we have 10% of the income going to missions. And sometimes it takes a while to get all, all together to send to the board. But we had two missionaries at, in Cambodia. Well, one missionary disappeared. I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> but anyway, the other missionary is still getting funds. And then missionary to uh, Spain. 10% goes, we want to try to get the Guatemalans to know that the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel, is for them as well as for you, as well as for me. So pray for us in Guatemala and help us to lift up our eyes and see the harvest. And we pray that you folks will lift up your eyes and see the harvest here in uh, Collingswood. And if the pastor and elders lead you to evangelize, even you have to stand in front of some ark <laughs> to hear out the gospels and do that. So the Lord bless you, and we'll be back on Wednesday night, and Stephen will give a PowerPoint with the colored uh, pictures, and Evelyn will be able to speak. Everybody likes to hear Evelyn talk. <laughs> she said that uh, everybody, when I speak, they don't hang on every word that I speak. But I said to her, when you speak, everybody hangs on every word. <laughs> so Wednesday night, hear what Evelyn has to say concerning the mission field and Stephen uh, with the PowerPoint. Let us pray. Oh God, Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the Scriptures. We thank Thee for the Word of God. We thank for the words of Jesus. My meat is to do the will of God. Look unto the fields. Look on the fields, they are white unto harvest. Lord, we know Collingswood needs the gospel. We know Guatemala needs the gospel. We know missions around the world need the gospel. The Great Commission is still in effect. It's in the Bible. We believe it. Help us, Lord, to fulfill in Collingswood, fulfill in Guatemala, fulfill in other places around the world. So, Lord, we thank thee for the scriptures that challenged us. And help us, Lord, to evangelize and not put it off and not say four months. Help us not to use, to, to use excuses, but to use our time in evangelizing through the Word of God and through the Gospels and tracts and through the Bibles. And Lord, we ask all this now in Jesus' precious, wonderful name and for his honor and his glory. Amen.